Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in in what's early evening here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We'll get started in just a few moments. I still see that your fellow attendees are settling in, so please feel free to grab that last cup of coffee or tea or go to use the restroom for just about 30 seconds or a minute, and then I'll get this uh, presentation started. All right, it looks like our numbers have stabilized here, so I'm going to get this show on the road. Thank you again for tuning in. I'm particularly excited about today's session on exploring the Master of Religion and Public Life. It is only our second year offering this program, and I'm so excited to have current students in our MRPL program who are able to offer their experiences um, on degree. So just to introduce myself. My name is Alessandra Ludeking, and I'm the admissions officer here at Harvard Divinity School. I've been with HDS for about six months now, so I'm fairly new, but I'm not new to the Harvard community. I was initially an admissions officer at Harvard Law School for a few years as well. And again, it's such a great pleasure for me to be here. Um, I'll be joined by my very esteemed colleague, Professor Diane Moore, and our five student panelists in just a moment. Want to touch base on what to expect for today's session. I'm going to start by providing about a 10 minute overview of Harvard Divinity School, our degree programs, student life, um, academic resources, the application process. And uh, so that'll take up about 10 minutes. And then of course, we'll transition to the main event, which is the panel session with Professor Moore and our current students. For these first 10 minutes, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my camera uh, just to focus in a little bit more on the content of the slides. During the presentation, please feel free to make use of the Q&A box. Um, and uh, we'll save some time at the end for some Q&A. So without further ado, we'll get started. All right, so Harvard Divinity School was founded in 1816 and is the first divinity school in the United States. It is a non-sectarian or non-religiously affiliated school of religious and theological studies that educates our students both in the academic study of religion and in the practical preparation for leadership in religious, governmental, and a wide range of service organizations. We have over 45 faith traditions represented in our student body, including, of course, students who are not religiously affiliated. And we have over 500 recurring worship services at HDS, which makes us the most religiously pluralistic divinity school in the world. And applicants often wonder what career paths are available to students with a religious graduate degree. And our degree programs truly lead to infinite pathways with alumni in every field and industry. And you'll get a taste of that with our current MRPL students who are coming to us from such a wonderful variety of backgrounds. Um, and typically graduates from our degree programs describe developing really useful skills such as deep listening, ethical reasoning, bridging divides successfully and navigating difficult conversations. So that's just a brief overview of HDS. Um, want to talk to you a little bit about who's actually at HDS. What do our students look like? And this here is just a quick snapshot of our first year students, which actually includes our 12 MRPL friends. So as you'll see here, um, we have 96 students in our Master of Theological Studies program, which is our most popular degree program. We have 52 Master of Divinity students 12 Master of Religion and Public Life students, of whom you'll meet five in a moment. We have four special students and two Master of Theology students. And I'll touch base a little bit more on our degree programs in just a second. Um, also within our incoming class, we have 55% who identify as female, 34% as male, and 7% identify as non-binary. 
The average age is about 28 years old with an age range of 21 to 68 years. And as I mentioned earlier, HDS reports over 45 religious traditions, 46 if we're being exact, um, with students speaking 62 languages. Um, I'm really proud of this statistic, but we have 121 undergraduate institutions represented, which again, just shows a great diversity of academic preparation and training from our current students. So that's just a quick snapshot of who's actually here at HDS. And then as I promised, I wanted to touch base really quickly on our four main degree programs. So the first one that we have is the MTS, the Master of Theological Studies, which is a two-year full-time degree that offers a really broad study in religion with opportunities for students to concentrate in one of 18 areas of focus. So students typically in this program are preparing for a doctoral program in religion or some related discipline, or they're hoping to approach a different field or profession such as law, journalism, public policy, education, arts, medicine, all from a perspective enriched by theological study. We do have very generous institutional grant aid that's available for the MTS program. Our next degree program is the Master of Divinity or the MDiv, which is a three-year full-time degree. And this degree is intended for what we call our 21st century spiritual leaders. So students in this program are hoping to learn the arts of ministry. And we very intentionally write that word with a lowercase m because we consider ministry to be very broadly defined, which includes anything from service mission oriented work, such as preaching and pastoral care and community organizing. And so in this program, students have a unique opportunity to link their academic study of religion with practice in field work and internship placements all across the country and around the globe. So that's the MDiv. This degree also has generous institutional grant aid available. The next one is our Master of Theology or the THM. And this is a little bit more niched. It's a one year full-time degree, but it's intended for applicants who already have a Master of Divinity or its equivalent. And there, it allows students to explore a topic in great depth, essentially, um, in the hopes that it will impact um, and form their ministry or deepen an existing area of ministry. There is no grant aid available for the THM, but we do have federal funding options and uh, resources for outside funding as well. And then we come to the MRPL, the Master of Religion and Public Life. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this as you're gonna hear directly from a faculty director, Professor Moore on this program and our student panelists. But I'll just reiterate that it is our newest degree program and it's one year full time. And it's such a great opportunity for mid-professional careers, mid-career um, professionals who are second, third, fourth career, who just wanna take some time off from their professions to gain some insight on how religion impacts their work. Um, we don't have grant aid available for this degree program as well, but we do have federal funding uh, options. So those are the four degree programs. And then, of course, we have our wonderful faculty who lead these degree programs. And um, it's no exaggeration to say that our faculty are among the most distinguished scholars of religion and practitioners of ministry in the world. And again, you'll have the pleasure of meeting Professor Diane Moore in just a, a moment. Um, and we have over 80 faculty and guest lecturers teaching close to 200 courses every year. And our faculty, again, includes some of the world's top scholars in Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, and so many other traditions. As you can see on the slide, 54% are tenured women and more than uh, tenured women are faculty of color, and more than one third specialize in non Christian traditions. So, this is just a snapshot of our wonderful faculty members. And then, of course, Harvard Divinity School wouldn't be what it is without our students. So um, just to give you a quick snapshot, again, we have over 35 student organizations that are led by our Office of Student Life. Uh, and it's also really easy to start your own org if you don't see one that interests you or fits, um, fits your particular uh, hobbies. 
Some examples of student organizations that we currently have include Queer Rights or Harry Potter and the Sacred Text, the HDS Garden Group, and Third Chapter, which is a group for students over 50 years old. These student organizations host over 60 student-led events every year, in addition to the over 500 recurring events that I mentioned earlier. And these include weekly worship services and also two uh, on-campus events called Noon Service on Wednesdays and Community Tea on Tuesdays. So I'm barely scratching the surface of all the wonderful ways to engage within our student body um, at HDS. And then, of course, we know that uh, graduate school is an investment, financial investment. And so I wanted to touch base on two uh, financial aid opportunities that we offer. Um, so we do offer generous institutional grant aid that, again, is limited to our Master of Theological Studies, MTS, and Master of Divinity, MDiv programs. Uh, and it's pretty generous. We offer approximately 90% approximately uh, of our MDiv and MTS students some form of grant aid, the vast majority of which is need-based. And that one does require a formal application process. And as you can see on this slide, we offer three tiers of financial aid in this um, that is need-based. So we can cover three quarters of your tuition or full tuition or full tuition with a living stipend. Uh, and then we do offer merit aid, but this is a much smaller pool and all applicants to our degree programs are automatically considered for this aid. Um, and if you are awarded, then it would include a full tuition grant with a modest stipend. And then uh, I'm not going to touch too much on the application components as we have several events, virtual events this fall that um, go into much greater depth on each of the application pieces. I'll only touch on the interview here to say that it is a brand new feature of our application cycle. We will be interviewing all of our degree program candidates um, for admission. So to be offered admission, you need to have received an interview, but this will be extended by invitation exclusively and will only be to um, a subset of the applicant pool. Just so you get a general sense of our timeline, our application has been open since September 15th and closes January 6th. The interviews that I mentioned will be extended by invitation uh, in late January, early February, around the same time as the financial aid application becomes available. And then all decisions are released in mid-March. All right, so I'm nearing the end here of my 10 minute spiel. Um, this is a slide so that you can stay connected with our office if you do have any particular questions about the application process or about life at Harvard Divinity School. The QR code will take you to our connect form so that you can sign up to receive updates from our office. And then of course, you're more than welcome to email us directly with any questions um, or you can email our current students. And then our blog and Instagram are great ways to uh, hear from current students directly as well through other mediums. So I've done plenty of talking. Um, I would really love to transition our event now to uh, my colleague, Professor Diane Moore and our student panelists. So I invite you to turn on your cameras um, and your microphones. And thank you again so much for your time. I'm really excited to learn about uh, our Master of Religion and Public Life. So please take it away. Great, thank you so much, Alessandra, and welcome everyone here and those who will be viewing this uh, video recording uh, following this uh, live event. It's really exciting for me to be here and I'm especially honored to be here with my incredible colleagues, uh, members of the first inaugural class of the Master of Religion and Public Life program, affectionately known as MERPL, <laughs> to uh, represent all of its grandiose stature. Uh, it has really been an incredible first year for us, and I'm just excited to, again, have you in the audience learn about the program through, through the experiences of, of just a few of our remarkable students. I did wanna give you a quick, uh, just a quick glance at some of the uh, other students who are in the program. There are actually 12 students enrolled uh, for this first year. Um, and I wanted to just, you'll, you'll see, you're gonna, you're gonna meet Phil and Alejandra 
here, but I also just wanted to do a, just a brief introduction. Ellie Duke is another member of our cohort, is a, is a, a journalist doing work uh, relevant to community building. Joe Martinelli works with, um, he's a professor of African studies and works with military attaches to help them better understand uh, the, what it means to be stationed in uh, throughout many regions in Africa. And his focus is gonna be working on helping him hit to enhance his own understanding of indigenous cultures in particular regions. And then also how he can translate that information to his students. Um, uh, Erica Williams is a, a, a longtime organizer and she's here to create and launch a new organizing campaign and networking uh, group that is, uh, that is her focus for her time here. Sarah Pearson is uh, herself a survivor of clergy sexual abuse and is working with a colleague to help enhance the uh, voices of survivors of clergy sexual abuse and also to move and work toward public policy change relevant to that, uh, that terrible and still ongoing tragedy. Susan Weaver and Eric Isaacson are both lawyers um, working on a variety of different arenas relevant to gender and sexuality issues, each of them separate, separate projects, but are working in that larger uh, advocacy, legal advocacy for people in LGBTQ communities. Uh, Megan and Ans, you will hear from, so I won't um, highlight their, their wonderful work and their projects. And John also, you will hear from. So that's, um, those are 11 of our 12 of our 12 cohort. And I'm, uh, I'm again, want to say just maybe a couple more words about what the new program is uh, a piece of. Uh, the MRPL is a, is a part of a brand new initiative at the Divinity School, which is the uh, Religion and Public Life program. And that has the Master of Religion and Public Life as one component. It has a certificate program for the other two large master's programs you just heard Alessandra introduce you to, the Master of Theological Studies, Master of Divinity, relevant to the same um, uh, frameworks, which is to enhance the public understanding of religion uh, in service of just peace. And uh, I wanna just say one more word about, about that set of values, which is this, the, that is driven by and recognizing that a, a, a incredible uh, lack of understanding about the rich and complex and powerful roles that religions play in quote unquote secular arenas, um, in our view has terrible negative consequences and not just intellectual ones. Those consequences um, are the ones that the program and I personally as a social ethicist, which is my training, am concerned with are the civic consequences that that lack of understanding about religion fuels bigotry and prejudice, hinders cooperative opportunities and endeavors across uh, local, national, and global contexts. Um, and that uh, on the flip side, understanding the complex and nuanced roles that religions play in cultures and in societies in very particular contexts really can um, enhance opportunities for deeper collaborations, for uh, challenging the terrible uh, binaries that are currently functioning in our society around uh, the divisive div divisions that, um, that are plaguing us, not only here in the country, but globally. And so the work of this program and these remarkable professionals is that they come to us, not very few of them with, um, some of them, but not very few of them with any religious studies training. Uh, but come with uh, expertise in their own arenas, in their own fields. And the, then it, this work then becomes a collaboration. We have a tremendous amount to learn from them about their own arenas, education or journalism or public health, as we'll hear. Um, and and we, these are areas we are not experts here at the Divinity School in. What we bring is language and understanding uh, ways to uh, understand about religion and its rich diversity and complexity. And then together that collaboration, these professionals are working to spend their year here helping to translate 
the particular relevance of a deeper understanding of religion to the professional audiences with which they, uh, with whom they work. So with, with that, I will um, stop talking for, for a few moments and I'm gonna invite um, each of the five candidates who are gonna be with us today. Phil Picardi will be joining us shortly, but I'm gonna ask each of them um, to just share information about themselves. So please everyone just obviously introduce yourselves in your quote unquote profession. But then um, uh, we have uh, several questions that we, I've invited the, uh, the folks here, the students to reflect upon and I'll be eager to get you all to just choose whatever those questions you wanna uh, address. So each of you will, will be giving about a five minute introduction of your work and who you are and, and your experience so far in this new program. And then we'll be able to open it up to questions. And if again, uh, please, if you are in the audience and have particular questions you would like to uh, either uh, to focus that I would answer or any of our panelists, if you could please put your questions in the Q&A um, uh, at the bottom of the screen. I'm sure we're all really used to these things now that we've spent so much time on Zoom. So, so with that, Anse, I'm gonna turn it over to you and thank, I just wanna say thanks again to these remarkable colleagues um, that are uh, forging the first, the first year's experience of this uh, very exciting program that I feel phenomenally privileged to be part of. So Anse, thanks so much, go ahead. Thank you uh, for the invitation, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Ant. Um, I am a public health scholar practitioner. Um, I serve as a faculty member, as well as I direct a fellowship, and I also work with a bunch of nonprofits, all related to public health. Um, and my work is broadly focused on the, uh, the broadly is tied by racial, social, and health equity. Uh, so I think about how different structures and policies uh, related to public health end up impacting certain populations uh, and their exposure differentials, particularly as those uh, processes are evolving very rapidly with climate change. Uh, so that's a little bit about my background. The rest of it, y'all are welcome to um, you know, reach out to me and I'm happy to chat about me personally or professionally rather. Um, but as far as the pr program is concerned, um, what drew me to this particular program is that for the, much like um, I'm sure many of the attendees as well as panelists here, we all have had a complicated history with religion. So there's that devotional expression side of things that you have a certain understanding of religion, which carries on uh, your, as, as a bias in your professional work as well. Uh, but over the years, one of the things that I've noticed in my own work is that uh, through that positivist thinking that we continue to approach public health with, uh, we dismiss a lot of the richness that comes from things like religion, trying to understand those and trying to account for those and trying to operationalize those in our work, both in uh, research, as well as in our teaching, as well as in public health policies. Um, so one of the things that's sort of like, you know, kind of semi-existential crisis that I went through during the pandemic uh, was that I was immensely disappointed in public health and its response to the pandemic, which I thought should have been a lot more aggressive. Um, and we should have sort of like, you know, put up a much stronger and aggressive front uh, and demanded more public action from our political leaders, uh, but that was not the case. Uh, so I'd been thinking about those intersections of like, you know, what would those new ways of thinking about same old issues as well as emerging issues would be. Um, and that's where religion was one of those common denominators that kept popping up over and over and over again. Uh, they're trying to understand that not only as, a, as an upstream structural determinant of health, if you will, uh, but also thinking about how do we partner with religious communities um, to really tackle not only our existing inequities, but the, uh, you know, very existential crisis of climate change. Uh, so that really sort of, you know, was one of my main things that I was looking for uh, and was very thirsty about that additional knowledge related to the intersection of religion and public health. Uh, but my challenge really was that um, I've been working in public health for more than around decade and a half now, and I am not necessarily looking for 
wasn't looking for a program that's too structured and it's too prescriptive that's going to tell me exactly you got to take xyz classes and you know you're going to come out an expert versus the beauty of this program which was really i think is sent professor moore an email at the beginning that this was really sort of like you know one of those very well crafted to meet my needs which is really that we have very limited amount of requirement uh, within which too you have a tremendous amount of flexibility to uh, you know design the projects the way you want to work around it. The rest of it is left very flexible to meet your needs specifically. Um, so yeah, like I'll, I'll just you know leave it at that. So that kind of drew me to this particular thing, really uh, taking a fresh look at my field and and my my entire vocational portfolio with the lens of religion. Uh, to propose a much more richer set of policies and programs within it uh, would be something that I would close it down to. Yeah. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much, Hans. Thanks, thank you for being here. And, and it's been just wonderful to have a chance to work with you this year. Megan, please um, share your experiences and tell, us, tell, tell this wonderful audience about yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Megan. And thanks, Diane, for inviting me to this panel. Um, I, so I'm a journalist. I'm the managing editor of a small nonprofit religion magazine called Religion Unplugged that I helped um, found in 2019. Um, you guys can tell me if there's too much background noise, by the way. I hope it's okay. fine. Okay. I'm sharing my office space. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm the managing editor of Religion Unplugged, and that nonprofit magazine is backed by a nonprofit that promotes journalism education and around the world and with a focus on journalists in the global south and giving them more resources to do journalism and part of that um, you know is recognizing that the global south has much more religious religiosity or religion in it and so those kinds of workshops were bringing together journalists of different faiths to talk about in part how to cover religion and how to cover religion better and a lot of those journalists are in areas that have conflicts that are heavily involving religion. Um, and so I got really interested in that topic after living in India. And that's how I, start, uh, how I started working with um, this magazine. And so when I came across the program, um, the Religion and Public Life program in Diane's work, which I hadn't heard about until the pandemic, I was just amazed by how relevant it was to what I really hope to focus my career on, which is, um, you know, religion and conflict and religion and peace and trying to understand religion more critically and what's driving these different yeah. groups. Um, and also to promote religious literacy. And that's really the mission of um, our magazine is to promote religious literacy among readers and the public and also in the media um, to comment on how the media covers religion and to provide like a more long form response, um, all of those things. So, um, so the reason why I came to Harvard Divinity and maybe not other schools, I mean, in large part was because of the Religion and Public Life program and Diane herself. Um, but also, I don't know if there's anyone, you know, that's listening that's a journalist, but um, Harvard Divinity is pretty recognized among a lot of journalists. And so I knew some other journalists who had come through the program and said great things about it. Um, they came, of course, through the MDiv or MTS programs, but similar experiences. Um, I would like to teach college um, later in the future, so I wanted to get a master's. Um, I really just wanted to expand my knowledge of history and how to analyze religion and public life better, meet new people. Um, and I think like what's really unique about the religion and public life program is that all of us here are working in our own fields in the quote unquote real world. <laughs> and so, it just feels so much different than a program where it's a very academic setting or where a lot of the students may have come directly from undergrad. And so that's really what I was looking for as well, to meet people who are really practicing something in their field and trying to think about how to integrate religion and what they're working on, so. Great. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much, Megan. Uh, Megan, again, thank you for your important work, which has been inspiring to all of us and really excited to have you with us. So, uh, Alejandra, I know you've been having some tech issues and uh, I'm so glad you're here. I'm just giving you a heads up 
that um, I'm so, first of all, glad you per persisted with your, <laughs> with these tech issues, but you will be after John. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that. So great. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. And unfortunately, we're not going to be able to see you on screen, but I'm going to put your picture on when you are when you're speaking so people can uh, can visualize. So thank you. So, John, thanks so much for being here. And please um, jump in. Tell us about your incredible work as an educator. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is John and I teach in a large public high school just outside of Chicago. And I offer courses at the high school level. Um, we have a dual credit course that's uh, accompanied with Eastern Illinois University. And then I also teach graduate courses to educators looking to address religion uh, in more sound ways. And had this opportunity, um, this, this degree program is the only thing that would have been possible for me. Uh, my school district allows for a one year sabbatical. Um, it does not allow <laughs> for two or three. So um, for those of you who might be in career fields where you can't take more than one year off, um, this is something that led me directly here. Uh, I would say and, and echo what, what Megan said, you know, the work of Dr. Moore and the cultural studies approach to thinking about religion in these really sophisticated ways is critically important to the work that I do and the work that matters to me. Uh, and Ans had mentioned, but the freedom offered by the class structures where we, we get to, in a sense, design our own degree on top of the, the two required courses uh, was extremely valuable in, in helping me see what was possible here for the year. And I think what has, has made this even more fun is, you know, the, my 11 classmates how each of us are taking all these different courses at all these different schools and then coming back together and, and sharing out and, and informing one another from all these different perspectives. It's made the work even more enjoyable. Uh, in terms of what led me here directly, um, thanks to the work of the RPL, I have taken great strides in rewriting a lot of my curriculum for my courses. And uh, that has led me to do more work with parents in our community, more work with adults in our community. But what I noticed is the graduate courses I was teaching educators and educational professionals, we were, we were bumping up against administrators who didn't know what we were doing. And so what I'm here to do is to develop what I hope is a robust and comprehensive program for superintendents and upper level public school administrators to understand the, the critical need for this religious and cultural literacy uh, awareness on their staffs uh, around the country. When it comes to challenges, I would say that time is, is important, right? Our time you know, with one another to network, our time to relax, we have to be really intentional, which has provided a challenge to me to make sure that we're, we're having enough space you know, to really think about this, which is, which is great. Um, I think time to think of how we're synthesizing all this information. Uh, it's a good thing. You know, we're lucky to have this challenge. And I've changed a lot in, in the two months so far of being here on campus. I feel like my creativity has gotten a, a jolt of energy. Uh, I've expanded my capacity for reading, for thinking, for writing. Uh, and I think I've, I've slowly, with the help of people on this panel, uh, as well as some of our other classmates, to really have a, a clear sense of my ability to affect change in a positive way, um, which has, has given me a lot of hope as we continue our work together and our collaborations. Uh, and as I end, I would just say this, in terms of advice for people thinking about this, um, I would just say, you know, from my perspective, just one year is going to go quickly. What could your life look like in a year, I think is an important question to ask yourself. Um, you know, I'm married, I have three children. And so for me, it was a, a family decision that was equally terrifying and thrilling. <laughs> and once I really considered the type of people who were going to be here and the, the nature of the work that each of us and our different professional disciplines was going to do, you know, it, it, there wasn't really a choice. I knew that I was going to be here um, to collaborate for the year. So to be here with all of you and 
as Ann said, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to reach out. But thanks, Dr. Moore, for the invitation. Great. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Um, just th thrilled to have you here. And Alejandra, again, also thrilled to have you here, and especially grateful for your forging ahead with tech challenges. Why don't you go ahead, please introduce yourself and begin talking. And again, I'm going to put your picture on screen so folks can at least see you uh, while you're sharing information about who you are, what you do, and what, um, what brought you to this program. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and admit right away that I get very nervous talking in front of groups, um, but I will forge ahead with that as well. Um, so what I do is I operate a tarot practice in Detroit and a crystal ball reading practice. And through that practice, I also offer um, workshops and um, workshops and support systems for people like myself who have been disproportionately impacted by some of the structural violence that hits Detroit and Detroiters really hard in particular. So there's a lot of, um, basically there's a really, really strong emphasis on accessibility um, in terms of finances, in terms of um, not offering anything that is too unapproachable in terms of like from a philosophical standpoint or um, even a theological standpoint. And some of that interest in accessibility also carries over into my other work, which is operating an independent record label that releases heavy metal and punk, um, mostly from Detroit, but not limited to. So I look at music oftentimes and other arts as an entry point into themes of occultism, which is really, um, really the foundation of my approach is occultism. So types of spirituality, types of um, ways of engaging ritual that are empowering to individuals, but maybe have not always occupied a really respected place within the mainstream. Um, not, not every mainstream, but in a lot of mainstream in, in the context of you know um, the United States in a Christian or um, hegemonic context, I guess, for lack of a better way of framing it. Um, with all that having been said, the Masters of Religion and Public Life, I actually found to be very compelling um, because of the strong emphasis on ethics, because of the strong emphasis on just peace, and because of the director, Diane Moore's influence in particular. Um, I think that the work that she has has committed to in terms of religious literacy, I saw as being able to advance my sort of cause in a really um, sincere way. And so I felt sort of welcomed. I felt like it would be a good place for me um, to, to just really also challenge myself to look at my own work in more nuanced and complex ways. And my cohort is, has really been invaluable in helping me kind of approach what it means to engage with people one-on-one -on -one in the context of having people share the, their vulnerability and their trust with me. And how can I navigate those power dynamics in a way that I feel is responsible and that I feel is symbiotic rather than um, fraught with in a, like a potential for, in uh, I guess, a unequal footing between me and the person that I'm engaging with. Um, and so the Masters of Religion and Public Life also is really helpful to me because I'm moving on to chaplaincy, integrating some of my um, occultist approach, but I do need credentials related to religion. And especially with a university like this, it really, really is helpful that the prestige and the reputation of Harvard lends some credibility that I, you know, that is needed. Um, and as much as I despise respectability politics, it's, it's really um, something that I feel will help me do my work more fruitfully. And I Wonderful. Think that's Wonderful. All. Thank you so much, Alejandra. And you, for someone who doesn't feel like you speak well in a public audience, you, uh, you, you, that was really clear and beautifully articulated. So thank you. Wonderful to have you with us. Thank you, likewise.
Okay, and Phil Picardi, you're um, you're doing sweep for us. Um, Phil, I'm so glad you're here and thanks for joining us. Phil was coming from another class, which is why I joined a little bit late. Phil, I'm gonna turn it over to you. So thanks so much for being here. Sure, thank you, Diane, so much. And um, it's such an honor to be here. Always an honor to hold space with you and with everyone from the MRPL. Um, my name is Philip Picardi. I am, uh, I guess you could call me a journalist. I'm an editor. I'm best known for being the chief content officer of Teen Vogue. I joined Teen Vogue as an intern at 18 years old. I interned there for three years and I rejoined the brand at 23 years old as Condé Nast's uh, youngest ever editorial director. I was tasked with basically saving Teen Vogue's website and social media properties. And, and the brand was troubled at the time because it had failed to grow digitally. So my premise and my pitch to the executive team of Condé Nast was that in order to grow Teen Vogue, they should start covering politics and social justice, which of course, every male adult in the room laughed at me. My premise was that teenage girls um, deserve a lot more credit than we give them in our society. And I knew that from firsthand experience because as a young teenage gay boy in a Catholic school, it was teenage girls who saved my life. Mm -hmm. I implemented the editorial strategy at Teen Vogue to launch wellness coverage that included reproductive justice, uh, gender identity. Uh, we covered the gender pay gap. We interviewed female politicians. Hillary Clinton name checked us in one of her speeches. Um, President Joe Biden uh, actually wrote an op-ed for us about campus sexual assault issues. Um, and Teen Vogue, of course, became the fastest growing women's magazine in the world for two years in a row due to this strategy. And one of the crown jewels of Condé Nast political coverage alongside GQ and The New Yorker uh, during the 2016 election. After that, I was tapped by my boss, Anna Wintour. If you've ever seen The Devil Wears Prada, she, she plays the devil. She's not really a devil. Um, and uh, she and I together launched a project called Them at Condé Nast, which is an LGBTQ focused publication, the first ever in Condé Nast history. And then I left Condé Nast um, to rebrand and relaunch Out Magazine. Out had a bit of an identity crisis, ironic, I know. And um, I was tasked with um, hiring the most diverse staff in Out's 30 year history. Um, and uh, we published a good solid year of incredible issues that I'm very proud of. But some things are just not meant to be and queer media is, was in a bit of a, a troubled state. So I left Out in 2019 and really wanted to take a break from the publishing industry. So I like committed to 2020 being my year of yes, like the Shonda Rhimes book, you know what I'm saying? And you know, then the pandemic happened. <laughs> so it was a little bit like, it was more of a year of no, you know? Um, but I, um, sure enough, at the end of 2020, I was being recruited for another EIC job. And at the so, sort of at the same time, it's a much longer story than this that I don't want to get into. I was told by my friend to look up HDS. I grew up in Boston. I had no idea what HDS stood for. I thought my friend meant HBS. And so I Googled HDS and saw Harvard Divinity School. And that's how I found the MRPL program. And I was like, oh, this application, I could handle this. And so I just like pulled an application together and I just sent it in with a prayer. And um, yeah. And then the rest, the rest is history. My focus here is on the sanctity of adornment. I'm studying the role that beautification plays in religious ritual and spiritual practice. I believe that it is our God-given right to be and feel beautiful and to also be reflected as beautiful by the society we live in. Um, and more importantly, I am not just here to work on an MRPL project or a final project. I'm also here because as a queer person who's felt really sidelined and marginalized by religion throughout my life and from my family, I really wanted to come here to reclaim God for myself. And it's a really powerful thing to be in community with people every day, especially to be like a relative novice after having been considered an expert in my field for so long, even though I, you know, I was young when I was accomplishing those things. It's really humbling to be here. And it's really powerful to be able to go from class to class, exploring the bigger questions of life and in society and then to be engaging in those questions with your classmates who are just people who are trying to do good and be good um, in the world. So I find this to be an incredibly transformative experience um, and I'm really grateful to my colleagues um, here on the phone and also who are not with us currently who have challenged me already to be a better learner and a better student. It's, it's a really wonderful experience. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Sure. Um, 
terrific. And th again, thank, thank all the panelists. I'm gonna say just a couple more words about uh, picking up on some questions we got a little bit beforehand that maybe none of you, well, you touched on a little, but I'll elaborate on. And then I'm gonna just pull up the Q and A uh, to see if there are questions from the from the participants that we can that we can respond to in our brief uh, remaining time together. So first, and and this has been a, a deep joy of mine. I think most most of the most of the panelists, students in the room, uh, gestured toward the the cohort. Um, and several of you have asked that what what uh, what is the nature of the structure of the program. It is quite open-ended and as you've heard, and we wanted to leave it that way. We wanted each and every student to be able to, you will, you would, you will apply with a final project in mind. You'll apply with a project in mind for those of you interested in, in, in pursuing an application. And then, uh, then your faculty advisor who you'll be uh, assigned to and, and me and, your, and the cohort of the MRPL, uh, Ad, uh, candidates who have been admitted um, work very closely together to have you, you shape your own program through the through what courses you take and that throughout the year you are working on your final project. So your classes are um, are should be helping and geared toward your work toward that final project because it's only one year. The cohort meets once a week and we stay together all year and it has been just an incredible joy uh, to be in the room with these 12 uh, incredible people. And, and I just wanna say the pow the, one, of the, one of the powerful dimensions of the program is the range of diversities represented. I wanted uh, right at the beginning of the, of the pod, of, the, of this um, web webcast, I showed just and gave brief introductions of those who are, most of those who are not in the room um, and we have an incredible array of both professions and also um, uh, political ideological convictions. And that's important. Uh, and because it is about not just um, understanding what, why a deeper understanding of religion matters, uh, but also to be able to translate our deepest passions and the vocations that bring every one of the masters of religion and public life students to, to this work is deeply vocational in the sense of recognizing that it is beyond just a professional uh, uh, commitment, but a sense of real um, uh, uh, commitment to, to larger, larger values and goals that, that each and every one of the candidates represents in their work. And so it's really about this helping and communicating with one another and then the larger religion public life goal of communicating the uh, public understanding of religion to broader audiences that we all share and that we are learning immense amounts from each other. And I, and I include myself in that as, as I introduced at the beginning that my, I have no expertise in any of these arenas um, professionally. And, feel honored to be in these conversations, which are some of the um, richest conversations that, uh, that I've had in a, in, a, in a long and very um, uh, privileged career in education. So, so uh, that's a, I think that's a real strength of the program, uh, I will say. And this is again, our first year. So maybe I think there's one other question that people are eager to hear uh, for in, and I'll just throw it out for any of the five of you or all of you, if you if you feel in, in, inclined to want to respond. People are interested in the kind of project, final projects you're doing. So if you could just say briefly, and again, just to kind of get a flavor of the sorts of things you're thinking about. And again, not all of you need to respond, but if any of you would like to, it would be really helpful. I think people would like to hear the diverse range of, of options. John, you you did say a little of yours. So yours is about working with 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 uh, administrators, public school administrators, to help enhance their understanding of religion. Um, Megan, I'd I want I'd love to hear you, have you share what your project is. It's a fascinating one, and uh, sure, lo yeah. love the idea. I, so I meant to share it in my opening, but I missed it. Um, but yeah, I'm working on a project um, kind of informed by my own background. I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church. Um, evangelical, and I'm now joining an Antiochian Orthodox Church. And so I'm looking at um, a wave of evangelicals converting to Eastern Orthodoxy in the U.S. and this question of 
what does it mean to be an American Orthodox Christian? And so part of that project will be um, going to Alaska and talking to Native Alaskans who really carried the Orthodox Church completely um, after Russian Orthodox missionaries came there, um, as well as looking at uh, some other parishes across the South that have attracted this kind of yearning for going back to the early church or the early New Testament church. Um, and also, you know, the fractures that are happening right now in evangelicalism and why. So that's what I'm hoping to explore and probably a series of articles. Great, thank you. Perfect, wonderful. Hans or Alejandra, because again, well, or Phil, yeah, jump, either any three of you, jump in. Go ahead, yeah, Phil, thanks. Yeah, sure. I'm so I, I said my what my project is a, is about. I'm hoping, and we are working on it, that my project will culminate in a fashion show at the Harvard Divinity School Chapel. And you know, fashion show sounds it's you can kind of get the wrong idea there, but what we're hoping is that people will be able to show how what they wear during worship or during their religious or spiritual practices is an important part of their faith. And so it will be members of the HDS community and of course their loved ones or the larger Harvard community um, who will be participating in this kind of real like exhibition, I guess, of, of their own faith traditions and, and helping people understand that even something like style isn't exactly secular. Um, so I'm really excited about bringing people together in a gathering space. I really wanted to do something with my project that was about highlighting people from the community and also hopefully centering people from the community who maybe don't always feel centered. Um, and I'm looking forward to developing that idea further and making it a reality. So pray for me. <laughs> so to, let, let me also just add, I think the, the, the work that Phil's doing around this, the, the conceptual and, um, and theological claims relevant to the sanctity of adornment, I think are uh, incredibly exciting and pretty cutting edge in lots of ways relevant to the study of religion itself. So, so the, uh, the project has the exhibition as a representation, but the, uh, the depth of work that you're doing, Phil, relevant to understanding what, is, what, is, what brings this together that has um, that is really, I think, um, disrupting so many assumptions about how we understand religions in general, in particular religious traditions, in a in a really um, rich and generative way, is something that um, is incredibly exciting. So I just wanted to add that. Thanks, um, Alejandra or or Anz. Anz is, Anz is you're, you've got a pretty you you've got a, a a plan specifically, Alejandra. If you also want to, I know you're thinking about a couple different options, but Anz, why don't you just jump in with your final project? Uh, sure, idea. sure. Yeah, um, so I am basically, I'll try to keep it super brief. Um, so I'm trying to look at, uh, so there are a lot of these normative assumptions that go into public policymaking, uh, one of which is that we operate in a secular society. Um, but end of the day, when you look at sort of like our demographics, like US is about 65% or so um, affiliation with Christianity within sort of, you know, a bunch of different denominations, but our Congress is up to closer to 90% identify as Christian. Um, so that ends up reflecting in public policies, which end up determining the health of our communities, particularly the community, communities that I care about deeply, uh, historically marginalized, socially vulnerable communities. Um, so that's a long-winded way of saying that what I'm trying to really question is that normative assumption that we operate in a secular society when we don't. Uh, so I'm really hoping to conceptualize in a brief paper uh, and start a conversation within the broader field of public health uh, that we need to be questioning that assumption, accounting for it, and thinking about new ways of uh, how do we approach public policies beyond uh, these sort of like in a set of orthodox assumptions that there is a separation of church and state uh, when that's not true in reality. And some of the examples, you know, very quickly are stuff like, you know, reproductive justice, for instance, like, you know, those nine people on the Supreme Court get to decide who gets, gets to have dignity and who doesn't. Uh, and then sort of like, you know, a lot of the uh, states, um, they pass all sorts of laws, be it um, anti-trans trans laws, be it anti-LGBTQ broadly. 
um, or re again, reproductive justice is another example, you know, needle exchange and so on and so forth. So there's this notion of moral dispossession of already historically marginalized communities, uh, which is a function of people's religious views reflecting and religion influencing all those policies, which then end up influencing our broader uh, health of the community in this country. Uh, so that's where kind of my focus is, uh, starting that conversation within my field. Yeah. Great, great. Thank you, Ans. Thank you. And Alejandra, do you want to say anything? You, again, no, not required, but if you want to jump in with a, a word or two about your final project ideas at this point, that would be great. Sure. Um, so what I am basically working on is sort of shifting gears. So a lot of, as I was saying, the work that I do is on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, it's within the public, but I would really like to be able to, to offer what I have to give and to also like receive the privilege of being present with people who are not in public spaces. So people who are housed or occupants of institutions, whether they're nursing homes or prisons. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm pursuing chaplaincy, but I am integrating an approach that is basically applying the ideas of spiritual caretaking, but infusing them with, um, with the values and the, the principles and, and methods of ceremonial magic. Um, and so that's, that's really what I'm doing. Um, and that's, that's, that's about it. Great, great, thank you. Thank you. We've got a couple other questions in the chat and I don't believe that the full audience can see the answers that my wonderful panelists have put in there. But let me say one question. Uh, Eric asked the question uh, that Megan responded to in our panel chat, uh, whether it's possible to keep going in your work while you're still a full-time student. And many of the, of the cohort are working in their arenas and professions. Um, uh, and, and some are able to take a full year off for the real focus and reflection. Megan says it's possible, it's challenging to keep it up. Uh, and so it's, it's not forbidden, quote unquote, in the program, but we are really encouraging people to be able to really uh, step away and try to concentrate on this, um, on this opportunity as much as, you're po as possible. Um, there's a common read in relationship to what people can, can prepare if who are interested. There's a common read called Red Nation Rising that the entire Divinity School is, is, um, is reading and uh, something that might be of interest for those in thinking about applying to the Divinity School. It's something that, again, the entire community is reading and engaging all year. Um, uh, as to what are the things you can read uh, relevant to the program, uh, Megan was kind enough to suggest that you read things that I've written, but I would encourage you to all be thinking about um, relevant questions in your own arenas, your own professions, where religion seems to be um, uh, either a, a, a challenge, a problem, uh, or potentially um, understand the arenas where religion intersects with your work to then get a better field, uh, for, feel for what's happening in your professions uh, relevant to religion. I think that would be a useful way for you to situate your own work and think about what you might wanna pursue or explore uh, during your time here. We are right up against the hour and I'm gonna turn it over to Alessandra to close us out. I just wanna thank all of you who are here as participants and all who will be viewing this at a later time and especially warmest thanks um, to, my, to my colleagues here, uh, the, co the first inaugural cohort of the, of the MRPL. It's a, an honor to be with you always and to uh, introduce this wonderful program to, to the next generation of students. And Alessandra, thank you and the admissions team for, our, for providing us this opportunity. So thank you, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for your time, Professor, and thank you, wonderful panelists. As I mentioned, I'm only six months into Harvard Divinity School, so it was a real treat for me, too, to hear from all of you and the incredible work that you're doing. I, I really value the flexibility and the ability for our MRPL students to be authentic and express their passions through these really flexible final projects, um, which I think is a really unique feature of the MRPL. So thank you again for the generosity of your time and for um, the generosity of sharing your experiences and, and your stories. And thank you, Professor, for facilitating uh, today's event. 
uh, it will be recorded. So rest assured you'll receive a recording of this. It will be posted to our YouTube channel as well as our events webpage. So again, thank you all so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.